Philippians chapter 4, verse 14. Good to see you all tonight. Bible says, yet it was kind of you. I like that. It was kind of you to share my trouble. And you know, Philippians yourselves, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have full payment, I've received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Verse 19 and 20. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be what? Be, say it like you mean it. Glory. Be glory for how long? Forever. Forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank your name. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name for the promises of Scripture that we can build our lives on. God, we read these words tonight and we feel the confidence of the Apostle Paul who experienced you in his own life in such a, such a dramatic and profound way that he was able to confidently say to other believers, and my God shall supply. Father, permeate our hearts with your presence tonight. Lead us to a place of strong conviction when it comes to the promises of your word. And God, may you lift up every struggling soul tonight, every person that is just working through the details of life, maybe just barely making it. God, we pray tonight that you would be the wind in their sails yes. and that you would provide abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. You know, there are, I think that Philippians, every, let me back up, every book of the Bible is quotable. Every book of the Bible is quotable. There are certain books of the Bible that just kind of seem ultra quotable. And, um, and I think that, you know, if you've been around for a while, uh, you know this is the case because you just listen to people talk. And when they are quoting scripture and things like that, you can kind of locate the books of the Bible that people are typically drawn to. I think Philippians is one of those books. I think it's one of those books. As we've worked our way through this little baby epistle, and we, we only have one more study done after this to do, certainly as we have worked our way through the verses, there are verses that you either have memorized or that landed on your heart in such a way that you thought, man, I really, that is a take-home verse. You know, that is something I need to anchor my soul to because, you know, as we read this book, um, there are spiritual anchors in this book that God wants us to bind ourselves to because those spiritual anchors represent spiritual laws that are as firmly founded as the physical laws that we deal with and experience on a daily basis, right? There are just basic physical laws that you experience on a regular basis that you, that you have grown accustomed to uh, just assuming this is the way that life is. Gravity operates you know, the same here as it does in Brazil and in Tijuana and in Tunisia. I jump off of this stage, I break my leg. Like, that's, that's what happens. It's gravity. I fall. Like, you know, I mean, it's always pulling you down. You can count on that. But just as much as we may count on physical laws that God has established in nature, we can also count on the spiritual laws that God has established as well. Are you with me tonight? For instance, go back to chapter one. There just are verses here in this book that I would encourage you 
to really memorize. And I know we don't talk about scripture memorization anymore. That's probably one thing that leads to a shallowness in Christian maturity. But I read through these verses and I think, man, verse 21, chapter 1, what a great verse to memorize. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not super long, not really difficult. Like you probably have uh, lots of movies memorized that are much more complex, but man, that is, that is a great verse, amen? I think about Philippians chapter 2, and this is maybe a little bit longer, but uh, nevertheless, it's still so powerful. Verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then not only that, he goes on to say, therefore God has a highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above what? Every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think, man, that, right? I mean, I mean, you know, you know how it is? Like you're bombarded with so much garbage on a daily basis. I think that's, that is good, solid, take-home truth to tuck away in your heart and mind. I look at, I'm not done, <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 verse 12, like halfway through, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That's so good. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. <laughs> that hit home, didn't it? Do all things. You're like, I'm not memorizing that. Look, if you just said that, you're grumbling and complaining already. You need to. Um, how about Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. How about Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Man, that's so good. How about Philippians chapter 4, verse 6? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses what? All understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, I look at verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then, of course, tonight... Um, all of it is good, but especially verses 19 and 20. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm saying to you tonight that you don't have to be like a ship that's tossed to and fro. Like those are biblical terms. We're not talking about afro. We're talking about like here and there by every wind and wave of doctrine or every circumstance in your life or by the rise and fall of the emotions within you because the truth is this, sometimes that's what our lives are predicated on and we find ourselves literally all over the map. And the reason that that is the case is because we've anchored ourselves to the wrong thing. We've anchored ourselves to the wrong thing. We need to anchor ourselves to the word of God. That means you have to, like David said, hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against him, that you might not be swept away in the, in the, in the moment of confusion or chaos or when all hell breaks loose in your life. You've got to have something that anchors you down. And this matters because I think this is what enabled the Apostle Paul to convey these terms to the church in Philippi with such confidence. If you just step back for a second and you read these verses and you reread them, what bleeds through the, 
what bleeds through the page is the confidence that the Apostle Paul had. I mean, it was strong confidence. I don't think he just put on his preaching voice. I don't think he was playing a game. I don't think it w he was putting on a show. I don't think he was trying to be something that he wasn't. He was communicating in terms of this church of Philippi that there was absolutely no doubt in his mind whatsoever about how God would work on their behalf. And I wonder tonight if you live your life with the same confidence. I wonder tonight if you live your life with the same confidence. I wonder tonight if you have lived your life in such a way that you have learned the faithfulness of God so that you can confidently not only stand on his faithfulness in your own life, but also convey with confidence his faithfulness in the lives of others. What we see tonight is really interesting. You know, Paul, obviously, this is, a, this is an autobiographical piece. Paul has kind of opened up his life as it were, not just to the church at Philippi, but to us as well. He's talking about a couple of things here. He's talking about the uh, overwhelming generosity of this church. And then he's also talking about the faithfulness of God to absolutely supply for every one of their needs. And so let's just kind of work through these verses together. He says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, that's like modern, there's modern Macedonia, and then below that is Greece. Philippi is in modern Macedonia, and then of course Athens and Corinth are in modern day Greece. When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. And then like the extent of it was pretty significant. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And then of course, you know, as we're gonna read in just a minute, Paul was under house arrest in Rome and Epaphroditus risked his own life to bring this financial support to the Apostle Paul in his particular time of need. And so there was a very special relationship that Paul had with this church. And there was a, it wasn't just like one way, it wasn't just Paul with the church, it was the church with Paul. You know, this was the only church, according to the Apostle Paul, that financially supported him throughout the time of his ministry on the earth. Regardless of the situation that he was in, it just seemed that the church of Philippi was always, always thinking of the Apostle Paul. Listen, always grateful. Always grateful, grateful for the Apostle's ministry and the history of the planting of the church. And you remember, Paul wanted to go north into Bithynia, Acts chapter 16, and the Spirit of God, the Bible says, forbade them from doing that. And then that evening, remember, he had the vision of the Macedonian man. And so when he got to Troas, he made the determination that they were going to go straight over. They went to Amphipolis, and then they went to Philippi. And then the planting of that church was just absolutely awesome and radical and came at a pretty significant expense for the Apostle Paul because you know he was beaten with rods and he and Silas were thrown into the lowest part of the prison and they were locked in stocks and then God did his miracle. Um, what gets me, I mean there's a lot that gets me in all of this as he's communicating in such beautiful terms to this church. What does get me is there's no sense of entitlement here on the Apostle's part. There's no sense of entitlement. He says this, it was kind of you to share my trouble. He didn't say, hey, you know what? It was the right thing for you to do because you guys know, you know how much I did for you. You know, my, you know how hard I served. You know how much I sacrificed. You know the hours I put in. You know I worked overtime and there were times I didn't even get paid for it. You know I labored and I made sacrifices and there was times where, you know, I wanted to hang out with my friends and I chose not to do that because I wanted to minister to you. And so, you know, it was the right thing for you to do to support me because I deserved it. I'm entitled to it. Paul doesn't say that. Like there is evidently and obviously missing from the Apostle Paul's communication here any sense of entitlement. And I just think that's important because today there's such an overwhelming sense of entitlement in the church. And, and sometimes even especially from, for, from those who have dedicated themselves to serve God and serve his people. Sometimes there's this, 
there's this prevailing attitude where it's like, well, you know what? The, the, you, you do all these things and you sacrifice and you serve and you start to think, well, the people that you're serving or the church that you're serving owes you something because of your great sacrifice. And the truth of the matter is this, as you serve God, no one owes you anything. Let me say it again, because sometimes it's hard for us to take in. When you serve God, your service to God is for God. It's for God. It's for his glory. It's, it's a response of obedience to the calling of God for goodness sakes. If that is the case, how does that make anyone that you are serving indebted to you for your service to them? This is the beauty of service in the body of Christ. There are no strings attached. There are no strings attached. There is no agenda that's being pursued. You know, the people that we minister to aren't things that we serve in such a way where we are trying to get something back from them. And I love how the Apostle Paul faithfully serve the people of God with no strings attached, with no sense of entitlement. The way that he says it in another place in Scripture is this, freely I have received, and so freely I give. I'm giving, in other words, out of the abundance of what God has poured into my heart. And so my giving to people does not indebt them to me, my giving to people is an expression of my worship to God. And that's awesome because then when you do get blessed, it's like your heart's filled with gratitude. There's a sense of thankfulness. This is what Paul says. He's like, man, it was kind of you to do that. Like it revealed that your disposition, the word kind means to have a disposition that's based in a moral goodness towards somebody. And so it means that there's a pure heart, a heart of love, Paul's like, your generosity revealed your heart towards me, even in the time of trouble that you shared with me. So I want to encourage you with that tonight. Um, I'm going to use some terms here. Paul is going to talk about uh, our giving and our investing, and then he's also going to talk about our receiving. And I'm going to frame this in basketball terms for you tonight, just in case, just in case you're a basketball fan. And if you're not then too bad, all right? I'll pick, a, I'll pick a different sport another time. But tonight is basketball. So there's a couple principles he talks about. He talks about, number one, the layup, right? So verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So Paul's like, man, I'm thankful for the kindness that you've displayed to me and you know you've come through time and time again. And you guys know how I've operated. There's no strings attached here. I'm not, I'm not after you for what you can give to me. I want to see you do the eternal layup. I want to see you lay it up. I want to see you investing in things that last forever. I want to, this is what Paul is saying because Paul is a heavenly-minded man. Paul is saying, I want to see that one day when you stand before God, there is going to be an abundance of fruit to your credit that you accumulated while you were living on this earth. Like, that's what I want to see. That's what I'm after. Every time you've supported me, I've been blessed and my heart has been filled, but I understand there's a bigger picture in mind that you are investing in heavenly things, that you are earning compound interest. That while you might be poor in this life, when you get to heaven because of your sacrificial giving, you will be experiencing the riches of God's generosity forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And of course, you know, for those of you who are Bible students, this was not some new principle that Paul was talking about. Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves. So he talks about how not to do the layup, all right? Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look, there's a, a million things to talk about when we read those verses, but the wisdom of this 
the wisdom of this, to be in a place where, when it comes to our possessions, we're heavenly minded. Set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, 1, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Knowing that we don't invest in temporary things for our own selves, but we're laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven because one day we will stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, and we will receive a reward for those things that we've done by faith in Jesus' name in this life. Like that, that's the spiritual, we're talking, we're talking about spiritual principles that, that are as sure, if not more sure, than the laws of nature that God has established. And that is a law that God has established. And you know what? If we really do believe in it, our lives will demonstrate that. And not only that, but the wisdom of this is, it also serves as a way of ensuring that our hearts are set on the right thing. Like your giving is not just for the people that you're giving to or for your heavenly inheritance. Your giving protects yourself. Your generosity protects yourself. It helps you keep your possessions in their place because, you know, your possessions want to dominate your life. I'm not saying that they in and of themselves have some type of will that, that, that they're trying to exercise over you, but our hearts sometimes can be so wicked that we can find ourselves in a place where we are possessed by our possessions instead of us possessing our possessions, if that makes sense to you tonight. So, so there's wisdom in it. The second thing that I love here um, from a, a basketball point of view is we see the score or we see the basket that's made here. And the basket ultimately is, I've received, verse 18, full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, check this out, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so Paul here says, man, the real score in this the real basket that was made was that your giving was for the glory of God. And maybe you didn't see this with your own eyes. Maybe you didn't see this with your own eyes, but when you sacrificed and you gave, it was like an aroma, a pleasant aroma that arose before God. You guys know when you smell something that you love, right? So I'll tell you, I love the smell of coffee. I love the smell of coffee. Like you walk into a coffee shop and my hope and prayer sometimes is that by the time that I leave, it is saturated my clothes. So I'm smelling that coffee all day long. And honestly, I feel the same way about Indian food. I go to eat Indian food because I love it, but also because I want to smell like it for the rest of the day because it's just so fragrant. And you know, like maybe, maybe you have your coffee maker. I, I, I say coffee. What do you guys say? Coffee? Are we all coffee? Is there anything else here that you're like, oh man, the smell of that is just awesome? Chocolate? <coughs> Cheese? F dude, <laughs> fresh baked bread. Did you get a loaf? Johnny Harris delivered me a... Johnny, <laughs> Johnny Harris, right before service, walked in with a bag of fresh baked sourdough bread. Right, and so, yeah. Don't ask me to share. No, I will share because I love you guys. But this is the thing. I'm like, I'm preparing. I've got 10 more minutes to kind of pray and go over my notes. But you can't just leave a fresh baked loaf of bread. I had to go over, tear a piece off. It was, it was fantastic. And I'm just saying, you guys know, like there, there's a real reaction that you have, that fragrant aroma of whatever it is, chocolate, bread, coffee, Indian food. You, you, you pick it, bacon. No one said bacon. I love the smell of bacon. I love it. I'm like, do you, do you guys remember, rem, remember Popeye, the, the cartoon? You remember Wimpy? It's like when the hamburger was cooking, he would leave the ground and his toes would be dangling and he would fly towards the hamburger. You, do you remember that for you old people? That's what happens with me when we're cooking bacon, when we're baking bacon. It's just awesome. I don't know why I told you guys all that information. You did not need to know it. I'm saying to you that if you could see through the physical veil, when you express generosity in Jesus' name 
to people in need, there's a, there's a reaction in the heart of God. This is what he says. It's an, a, a, a fragrant aroma. It's a fragrant aroma. It's like this beautiful flower that's blooming, this rose that's blooming, and you know it's, you're looking at it from afar, and it's pungent and powerful, so you stick your face in it, and, man, you breathe it in. And God breathes in your generosity and acts of worship. There's a fragrant aroma. You know, when Mary of Bethany was anointing Jesus, the Bible says she pulled the seal off the oil of spikenard, poured the whole thing over him. And this is John in reflection. He said the fragrance filled the room. That was not the only room that was filled with fragrance. The throne of God in heaven, that room. That room was filled with the fragrance of worship. And so, listen, don't minimize don't minimize the, the, the significance of what happens when you live with generosity in Jesus' name, particularly to people that are in need. It not only fills your life with a beautiful fragrance of generosity, it not only blesses other people, but the very throne room of God is filled with a fragrance of worship. Um, and not only that, he also says, and pleasing to God and pleasing to God. It should please us to please God. It should please us to please God. Let me ask you tonight, what are you living for? Like, what, what are you living for? If, if, um, I watch you guys react to this and talk to each other. It's just classic. If I were to say to you, hey, uh, don't do this, but pull your phone out and open up your notes app, and I want you to write down right now, what are you living for? If you, could, if you could condense that in one sentence, in one sentence, what would it be? What would you say? I would suggest to you tonight that living to please God is the best thing to live for. To be in a place where it's like, God, in everything that I do, I ultimately just want to please you. I love the simplicity that the scripture lays out this uh, blessed life with. And Jesus, of course, said, you, you know, he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not accumulating things on this earth, the wisdom of that, remembering that when we live generously, that it pleases God, the, the throne room of heaven is filled with a fragrant aroma and then he goes on to say, you know, in response, and my God, right, to the church, to the people that were living a lifestyle of generosity in Jesus' name. He said, and my God, because remember, we keep things in context at, at Awake in Las Vegas. We keep things in context, and it's easy sometimes to take verses and rip them out of context, and you know, they're beautiful when they stand alone, but remember, verses 19 and 20, this confidence of God's supply is built within the context of a lifestyle of pleasing God, right? A lifestyle of pleasing God. We don't just rip these verses out and then apply them willy-nilly. I don't know why I just said that. Like, that's the only thing I could think of. Arbitrarily. You know, we don't, just, we don't just say, hey, yeah, well, listen, here's a promise, and it doesn't matter how you live or what the state of your life is, you can just cling to that. No, there's a context here, and the context is a life that's being lived to please God, and that compelled the Apostle Paul to speak with strong confidence, right? And this is the third basketball instruction that we have. We have the layup, we have the score, now we have the assist, we have the assist. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So there's a spiritual axiom that, that um, I want to teach you tonight. Some of you probably know it. And the spiritual axiom is this. When you live a life of generosity in Jesus' name, you will not be able to outgive God. You will not, and I'm Sometimes the pushback on that is, well, you know, pastor, you, you don't ever want to be in a place where you use that type of thinking to manipulate God into giving. In other words, something like, well, you give, you give, and you give because when you give, the Bible says God will give more back to you. So you really want to get a lot, and if you want to get a lot, you need to give a lot. Like, we don't think like that. We don't think like that. And of course, 
That's not the type of motivation I'm talking about. And it certainly isn't the type of motivation that Paul is talking about. We're talking about the spiritual axiom, like I said, that when you live generously in Jesus' name and you are faithful with what God puts in your hands and distributing it as the Spirit of God leads you to distribute it, you know what he's going to do? He's going to put more in your hand. He's going to supply, the scripture says it like this, he is going to supply the sower with seed. He is the one who is going to, because the fact is, Whenever we give generously or live generously, we are doing so because we're on God's mission. And God's mission is to see the unsaved, the lost, rescued, drawn to his love, and brought into the kingdom of heaven. And the fact is, we would never be on that mission at all if it wasn't for God speaking to us in the first place. And so, I'm, like, this is like a roundabout way of saying God was the one who initiated you into his kingdom and onto his mission, and you're on mission because God initiated it. And if God initiated you on his mission, then he's going to supply everything you need to execute the mission that he initiated in your life in the first place. Does, does that make sense? I don't even know if that makes sense. So... Paul is just simply saying, as you faithfully given for the gospel, God's going to supply abundantly for your needs. You can't outgive God while you're living a faithful life. Jesus says it like this. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. That's into your possessions. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Paul expands on this principle and he says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 to say, and these are, this is a paraphrase, but, you know, if you live a stingy life, expect God to be stingy towards you. If you live an abundant life of generosity in Jesus' name, expect God to be generous towards you. I love the confidence. You know, there's no question here. Paul says, without qualification, my God will supply. My God will supply. You know, he didn't just say God will supply, right? He did, he's not speaking theoretically here. He's not just speaking theologically here. Paul is speaking experientially here, here. There's a big difference, I would say, in saying, hey, God will supply, as opposed to my, my God will supply. I mean, one is information, one is inspiration, one is info, one is inspo. I think that Paul is speaking out of personal experience. I think it's the same thing that happened to Moses. You remember 10 plagues descend upon the nation of Egypt. There's a sea that's parted. There's a Pharaoh that's destroyed. And then as that wraps up, Paul, or excuse me, Moses sings a song and he says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. He personalizes all of that theology. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. All of that because God moved faithfully through Moses' life. And I believe it's the same way with the Apostle Paul. Everything that happened in his life as he prayed and as God came through, he recognized it was God moving on his behalf. And so he was able to confidently say, based on personal experience, listen, church at Philippi, I can tell you. I can tell you because I've walked the road. I can tell you because I've been in those moments of deep need. I can tell you because, because there's been plenty of struggle in my life. I can confidently say to you that God will come through for you just as he has come through for me. And I want to say to you tonight, awake in Las Vegas, that my God, my God, not just Paul's God, not just Moses' God, not just Mary's God, but my God shall supply 
all of your need because my God has done that for me. I've experienced God time and time again. Come through for me and supply for my need and for my family's need and for this church's need. There have been times in this church where it's like we've got 120 people on staff and we've got $50,000 in the bank and payroll's coming up. Like, like you don't get that. And payroll's like hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And, you know, when the economy f- dropped out, when the, when the economy, uh, you know, blew up in 2008, those were really challenging times. And we were on our face and we were praying and every single time God faithfully came through. I'm just saying to you tonight that this builds confidence. Your experience of God builds confidence in your life so you can sincerely say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says he will supply. The word supply means fill to the full. It's a, it's a very illustrative word. Fill to the full, to full fill, to absolutely satisfy. The challenge sometimes is when God fills to the full, it is often preceded by a reduction in supply. What I'm saying to you is there are times where God will allow it to get lean and mean. God will allow it to become challenging. God will sometimes dry up our resources to compel us to lean into him so we can experience the significant miracle that he wants to do in our lives. And so when you live with confidence, knowing that God will always supply, when you go through one of those times where where times are lean, when things, resources have dried up, when you discover that, hey, you've been relying on things that you shouldn't be relying on, understand that in those times, you don't have to be in fear. You don't have to be panicked. You don't have to uh, let your emotions rule or run the day. You can have confidence because that is preceding the miracle that God wants to do in your life. And this is the way that Paul says it. He says, my God will supply every need or all your need. All that you need, all of the essentials, all the basics, all the necessities, nothing will be missing. Let me say it like this. Check this out. You will have everything that God wants you to have. Okay? Did you get that? I didn't say you will have everything you want to have. I said you will have everything that God wants you to have. Because there's a big difference between our wants and our needs. Paul, of course, did not say, my God will supply every want of yours. He said, I will, God will supply every need of yours. And the reality is God knows, God knows what we need better than what we know what we need. Do you understand what I'm saying? We spend a lot of time counseling God. Hey God, you know, I, 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 and we couch it in terms that are biblical. God, I need this, and I really need this, and don't you know I need this? And God's like, no, you don't, fool. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't need that. That's not a need. That's a want. And, you know, sometimes motivationally, it is hard for us to discern the difference between the two. James says it like this, you have not because you've asked not, and when you did ask, you asked amiss, seeking to spend it on your own lusts. And so James is like, hey, church, uh, there's, a, there's, there's an absence of supply right now, number one, because you're not asking, and number two, when you did ask, it wasn't about the glory of God, it, you know, and you might, might have said, hey, you know, God, I, I really, really, really need that brand new Bentley. I need it, God, because I want to minister to people. And I want a ministry, you know, where I can, like, reach out to people and take them for a ride and share the gospel. And I'll load up, you know, the, I'll load up the car with tracks and we'll make an awesome ministry out of this. And God's like, who do you think you're fooling? Who do you think you're fooling? God, I need to live in that neighborhood. God, I need to live in that neighborhood. I need to have that house. 
Because you know what, God, I want to have a life group there. I want to start a church in that house. That'll be so awesome. And don't get me wrong, sometimes those are the leadings of God, but sometimes they're not. And we find ourselves in a place where we step way beyond the, the, the will of God. We step beyond the need and into the want. We get ourselves in trouble, and then we look at God like, how come you, how come you did this to me? And God's like, I didn't do that to you. You did that to you. You made a whole bunch, bunch of decisions that, that you may have couched in biblical terms, but it had nothing to do with me whatsoever. You know, sometimes what happens is we start looking at what God has put on other people's plate, and we start wanting what other people have, and so our prayers about what we need are really issues of competition or, or issues of covetousness. One of my favorite pictures of Levi, you know, our youngest. Um, we were at my sister's house, and we were having a big picnic in the backyard, and Levi's cousin is the same age as him. And so there's this picture, and we just served cake and ice cream, and this cake was killer. Levi's got this massive plate. He's going to kill me for saying this, but he has this massive plate of cake and ice cream. He's, his fork's gone into it. This fork's coming up to his mouth. He's about to take this huge bite of cake. Sophia is next to him with her little piece of cake, and he's looking over at her cake while he's about to take a bite of his own cake. And you can tell he's like, he's like, not only do I want mine, I want hers too, you know? And sometimes, sometimes we can be so focused on what God has given other people, we lose sight of how good he's been to us and the blessings that he has placed in our lives. And this may sound crazy to you, but it's not just possessions. Sometimes it's friendships, and sometimes it's ministries, and sometimes it's spouses. Sometimes it's spouses. Like your heart, if you don't, if you don't guard your heart, for from it, the Bible says, springs the issues of life, you can find yourself coveting things, coveting for things that God never intended for you to have. At the end of the day, if you love God, you know that everything that is in your hands has been placed there generously by him. And for those, yeah, I don't, I don't, mean, to, I don't mean to interrupt. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory, according to his riches and glory. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, don't forget God's not broke. This is my <laughs> modern day translation. Don't forget God's not broke. God provides according to or out of or in relation to or corresponding to or in proportion to. So how vast are the riches of God's glory? They're infinite. They're infinite. In other words, your God's not going broke. You know, the, the bank account's not running dry. If you were to come to me and say, hey, um, I have some bills to pay, and I said, okay, you know, according to what's in my bank account, I will pay your bills. I hope you don't have too many bills, you know, because, because there's, a, there's a finite limit to what I have. On the other hand, with God, there is no limit. There's an endless su supply and so I want to encourage you as, you know, you've shaped your heart to be generous in Jesus' name and you're living in a way where your motivations are pure before God, have faith in God's ability to provide for you. Remember, don't have meager faith. Don't have a poverty mentality. Don't think that God can just barely make it in supplying for your needs. Understand that he is able to, out of the riches of his glory, supply for you. That's where your confidence is at. You know, it's like, hey, you're having a hard time. You got more month than money. And it's like, God, I'm confident. I'm confident that you're able to handle this. I, early on, you know, when I was a young believer, people were like, hey, you know what? Don't worry, Derek. You know, he owns a cattle on a thousand hill. And I'm like, I don't need beef, bro. I need money. Like, <laughs> like what the heck does that even mean? You know, I don't need cattle. I need cash. But, but the whole point there was like, you know, there's an infinite supply that God can draw from by or in Christ Jesus. And so that's important because this promise isn't just for anybody. This promise isn't just for anybody. This promise is for those who belong to the Lord, those who've been born again by faith in Jesus Christ. I hear people talk about the generosity of God in general terms. 
And it's true that there's common grace. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But God takes special care of his children. God takes care of his kids. Jesus is like, hey, if you being evil know how to give your kids gifts, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so remember that your relationship with God is far deeper than you can probably ever even imagine. He is your heavenly Father, and He takes joy in providing for you. The purpose of it all, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so tonight I just want to ask you, I want to go back to that question, what are you living for? What are you living for? What is the purpose of your life? What is it that you are after? And I, I want to wrap up by sharing a quote with you tonight. This was the quote that captured Chuck Smith's heart. And for, for those of you who don't know, uh, we're Calvary Chapel. Uh, Calvary Chapel was founded in the late 60s um, through a great move of God's Holy Spirit. God used um, a husband and a wife team, Chuck and Kay Smith. Chuck was at, um, it was a summer camp, a summer youth camp, and he heard this quote. He was going to dedicate his life to being a surgeon, and then he heard this quote, and the quote goes like this. You have one life, and that will soon be passed. Only what you do for Christ will last. That, like, struck him like lightning, and it was in that moment that he dedicated himself to full-time service in a pastoral calling. And, and, and the point is this, not that everyone is called to be a pastor, but everyone's called to live with that mindset. You have one life, and that will soon be passed. Only what you do for Christ will last. You and I have one shot. We've got one shot at this life to get it right. Let's not fail in living a life to please God.